Good day and welcome to the Center for Research Libraries uh, webinar on mining big economic data. We um, titled this text data mining, text and data mining webinar because this is the, I think about the fourth in the series of webinars we've done roughly on the, on the subject of text and data mining. Um, today we're really going to talk more about mining than text and data mining. The, uh, the, we'll look at the challenges of, uh, of uh, using big economic data sets and um, how the, the Economist Intelligence Unit and, and others uh, sources of data uh, work in the, in the research environment. I'm Bernie Riley, President of the Center for Research Libraries, and I'll be um, moderating today. Um, we thought that it would be useful to tackle this subject, CRL did, because we have, um, as a consortium of um, university and um, college research libraries, uh, CRL has since 1949 collected heavily in the area of trade and commercial data. Uh, particularly materials in print and microforms. Here I'll collect it extensively, central bank reports, statistical abstracts, official gazettes, and other kinds of materials, many of them from uh, difficult parts of the world to acquire materials from Southeast Asia, South Asia. Um, we have um, collected those by many means, and uh, but in the digital environment, it's a whole new supply chain, so we, um, we are looking at the um, electronic sources of those materials and web sources of those kinds of materials, particularly to support research in the areas of public policy, political science, economics, and historical and area studies. Those are the areas of advanced and original research that CRL supports most. Um, the digital environment, we're looking at um, more real-time access to comprehensive data sets. What we've had in the past has been slow access to relatively spotty material, so we, we think we can do better in the, um, in the new era. CRL is exploring terms for subscription and access to a number of financial and economic data sets and databases, uh, among them the Economist Intelligence Unit data sets or databases global financial data series, the IMF, e-library, Privco, and et cetera. Uh, to, today we're going to uh, heavily feature the Economist Intelligence Unit and how they, and learn more about how they do things. Before we get started though, a couple uh, housekeeping items. We have uh, over 100 people registered to participate in this webinar, so we ask you all to uh, press star six to mute your phones. Uh, I'm told that that's already been done, so it's been muted by Big Brother. Um, that the reason for that is so that we can uh, that we don't get a lot of noise feedback from people's phones. Uh, very often, you get um, a great deal of interference in back from either background noise or feed electronic feedback. So, with so many people registered for this to participate, that would be overwhelming. Um, we also ask that you we invite questions throughout the. Um, throughout the program, uh, although we'll have a question and answer period after the, uh, the presentations. Uh, you can post questions and comments by using uh, the blue icon at the top of your screen, the one that says the blue icon with a little uh, uh, dialogue bubble that says chat. That's where um, using that will enable you to uh, type um, questions and comments to us and that we will then relay to uh, the speakers. Okay, we have the um, next slide. I want to introduce our speakers uh, to uh, today's agenda. First, we have a little overview that I'll give and then an introduction to the Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, a uh, brief presentation on case studies, and then discussion and Q&A. Our presenters will be uh, Robin Bue, who's here with us at CRL, who is the um, Economist Intelligence Unit's um, Managing Director, and Robin is um, Managing Director of the Business to Business Arm of the Economist Group, and he's responsible for the overarching commercial and editorial success of the EIU's business in reporting to the, and also reports to the Economist Group CEO. Prior to becoming Managing Director, Robin was Editorial Director and Chief Economist of the EIU responsible for the company's editorial operations, and he led the intellectual debate across the business. Um, 
at various times in his career. At the EIU, he has led the economics unit, the sovereign credit and operating risk team, and the global forecasting team, and the customer research team. Chris Pierce runs the economist intelligence unit, um, it runs the, econo the economics unit at the economist intelligence unit, excuse me. It's the team specializing in quantitative research and forecasting. He's got a number of years' experience developing subscription services. He's consulted with many blue chip clients over the years. He's helped launch, uh, moreover, many of the EIU's main products, including country data, and more recently, the Economist Intelligent Unit's Access China service. So, okay, uh, today's um, research. We'll take a, just a brief look at research and how it's changing some of the challenges. Most of you know um, Kenneth Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt's 2011 book, um, the, uh, This Time is Different, Five Centuries of Economic Folly. Uh, this book had a huge impact on public policy, not just in economics, but it also formed the, um, as it was called, the intellectual bulwark in of, of the austerity politics by figures as um, as, as well known as, as our own Paul Ryan. Um, the book surveyed um, 20 advanced economies over, 19, over the years 1946 to 2009, and the same 20, and, uh, the same 20 economies over roughly 200 years. Uh, it also surveyed 20 emerging market economies between 1970 and 2009. So massive amounts of data were collected for this um, for this publication and the, the publication success largely rests on that data. Uh, on their website, the, um, the um, Reinhardt and Rogoff uh, provide public access to country historical data for public debt and GDP growth in spreadsheets. This is an example of one of the um, spreadsheets that they provide. Um, it's, uh, this, is, this data is from IMF. The, the, uh, International Monetary Fund, and it's on exchange rate for national economies from 1971 to 2007. As you can see, it's not easily reusable, being in um, Excel spreadsheet form. It's uh, hard to aggregate with other relevant data, and so hard to make comparisons. That uh, flaw in that actually became very material when uh, a group of authors from of economists from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, pointed out some of the practical problems with, or tried to test the and replicate the um, findings of uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, and found that there were a lot of problems with the data uh, when they looked very closely with the data omissions, questionable methods of weighting, and even elementary coding errors. So they this made it really difficult to replicate the results. They said, in fact, that we were unable to replicate the Reinhardt and Rogoff results from the publicly available spreadsheet data. Um, and that um, they cited a number of gaps and oddities in the data. So big data projects are happening with, um, with siloed data to a large extent. Uh, things are changing. The, um, in one signal event last year, 2000, oh, sorry, uh, the, at another example of historical data being used in Berkeley uh, in a working paper from the Berkeley Economic History Lab a paper by uh, Joshua Hausman, Fiscal Policy and Economic Recovery, the case of the 1936 veterans bonus. Uh, this is a June 2013 working paper that tested the conventional wisdom about fiscal policy in the 1930s. Um, here, the, some of the data cited is Federal Works Project WPA survey of, the survey of consumer purchases in 1936. This is taken from the um, ICPSR collection. Here, again, you have problems of structured data, but data that's largely trapped in unminable formats. What's happening now with government-produced data is that the signal event, which is the um, last year's uh, executive order, uh, which mandated that, um, that U.S. government data must be open and machine-readable, so that that becomes the new default for government information by virtue of a, um, an executive order done issued last May by the White House. The idea is that the openness of government data will strengthen democracy and promote the delivery of efficient and effective services to the public. Um, and it can also um, 
the White House believes can fuel entrepreneurship, innovation, and scientific discovery to improve American lives and, and even contribute to job creation. So, so in recent years, thousands of government data resources across fields such as health and medicine, education, global development and finance have been posted in machine-readable form for pre, free public use on data.gov. That is uh, just one example of the, um, one instance of the um, move towards open government data that's happening around the world. This is the uh, data portal uh, that was opened last February by the African Development Bank, their statistical data portal. This is a joint development of the um, African Development Bank statistics office and the um, a data analytics firm Prognos that went online in uh, February 2014. Uh, even more publishing and, and exploiting of government information is uh, being, well, the, the, the open government information in the U.S. is being exploited by other um, commercial firms. This was rank and file's aggregation of um, data from the Securities and Exchange Committee. It's designed to make company filings with the Commission available, and, and company filings that are already available in the SEC's Edgar database more intelligible. This is a, uh, it provides snapshots of industry relationships such as this multicolor influence graph that charts the um, various companies in which Google executives have owned shares. Those include Apple, Netflix, LinkedIn, Zynga, Cisco, etc. cetera. Uh, taking publicly available data uh, in the Edgar database and making it as, and, and making it available uh, as uh, Alex Howard said recently on his blog, for humans. And so the, um, another example is cited in the New York Times recently is the Enigma.io, which is a um, firm founded in New York in 2012 uh, that obtains, standardizes, and collates thousands of data sets about companies from the Department of Commerce data that's publicly available data, but then aggregated in, um, in electronic form. So the, uh, with this, we can move on to bigger and better research projects. This one, the um, a 2013 project at Duke University, uh, the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University, in um, collaboration with the American Cancer Society in Southeast Asia, Tobacco Control Alliance. This was a study, this is a data set uh, published by them. Um, Base that um, supported a study on the illicit uh, trade in um, tobacco in Southeast Asia. The study covered a number of countries, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Most of the data for this was obtained from freely available serv services like the United Nations Comtrade Database and the World Bank Data Bank, um, in information on trade balances and GDP. But other data had to, still had to be um, painstakingly extracted from organizations, including um, by people going, from Duke going to the regions in question and, and uh, dealing directly with the government agencies. So we still have challenges in harmonizing, um, in, in acquisition of data, harmonizing that data, and replication and persistence of source materials. So that's just a, uh, a little picture of the um, how data is being um, used in, um, in research projects, one at uh, Harvard and one at uh, Duke University, to get more granular and get into more practical um, practical side of this, I would like to um, introduce Robin View, who's the Managing Director of the um, Economist Intelligence Unit. Robin. Thank you very much. Um, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on wh where you are. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Chicago, um, participating in this, this um, webinar. Um, my role is to introduce the EIU as an organization and, and some of the data sets that we have available, um, which can be used by the academic community for research. Um, then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, who is um, on, on the webinar from London, who's going to take you through three specific case studies um, which outline the way that our data has been used um, for research efforts in the past and give you a sense about how um, our information sets can therefore um, be used in an academic context in order to, to drive a research agenda. Um, so just thinking about the Economist Intelligence Unit, um, if we 
look at where we came from. Actually, obviously, we are related to The Economist magazine. Um, most of you will not recognise the Scott that's appeared on your screen now because we have moved into full colour and use um, graphics as well as text to describe what we do. But this is a facsimile of our first ever edition in 1843. Um, and also our mission statement, which remains with us to this day and is a mission statement that carries across from the newspaper into the EIU itself to, to take part in a severe contest between intelligence which presses forwards and an unworthy timid ignorance obstructing our progress, which is, I think, a very good mission statement for us, but I suspect would serve as a mission statement for many of the institutions which have dialed into this call today. Now, the group has progressed considerably since then. If we um, look at how the Economist Group is structured today, there's really three main components, the newspaper itself and the associated businesses um, that sit alongside it, and many of you will have attended or spoken at Economist conferences, for example. Um, we own CQ Roll Call, um, which is, for those of you who are not aware, is a US, a Washington DC based business which analyzes what's going on on Capitol Hill in quite a lot of detail. And there are data sets, which I won't talk about today, associated with that. Um, so which, um, which politicians are voting for which piece of legislation, how long it's taking for particular bills to pass um, through the House and the Senate. So there's quite a bit of data there on US federal politics, which is of interest to academic researchers, but I will not be discussing today. And then there's the organisation which I manage, um, the Economist Intelligence Unit, um, which we would describe as the business-to-business -business arm of the Economist Group, and we help organisations think about the world. Our clients are, in some of our clients are commercial, many of our clients are commercial, but we also have a significant following in the academic community and also the multilateral and not-for-profit community too. So if we look at where the EIU um, um, came from, the Economist magazine itself was founded in 1843, we were found, founded um, in 1946, so the first idea, um, first reference we can find, so we do our own data mining, was in an internal memo in the middle of World War II um, when the editor of the newspaper, whose photograph is there, our editor today has fractionally more hair than that, but apart from that, very similar, um, uh, decided to spin off essentially the library function of the newspaper into a commercial undertaking. Um, which was meant to earn an independent profit and help readers of the newspaper think about international issues in a slightly more commercial context. So if we move on and have a look at what that um, looked like. So we were born in 1946, immediately after the war, um, essentially to answer questions that were being posed to the editor of the newspaper. Um, business leaders were writing to the magazine asking for advice on how they should run their operations and where they should look for markets in an environment in which many of their traditional European um, export trading partners um, were um, really bombed out and, and not available for, for um, trading. So the EIU was born in order to help businesses think about international issues and that's remained with us ever since. Um, we have here a, a facsimile of our, um, one of our first reports, the annual review of um, British industry. Uh, for those of you who are still interested in print, and I suspect that's not many of you now, um, but we do still offer um, print publications. Our circulation is now very small, um, but some clients do still take us in print. Um, the, and the publications have moved on somewhat since that, that screenshot, but perhaps not as much as you might think. Um, and then we've expanded also into consulting. Um, so that means in a commercial context, helping businesses think about their um, international expansion issues. In an academic context, that often means providing bespoke data sets specifically for um, individual projects. Now, if we look at what drives the EIU today, um, essentially our focus has always been international. Um, and increasingly it's international emerging markets, so we are focusing on helping our clients understand what's going on in the developing world. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that the developing world is rapidly overhauling the more traditional um, developed markets of Europe and North America um, and will at some point within the next 10 to 20 years or so actually exceed the size of the developed world. So our focus is very much on the emerging markets and that's been an area of, of considerable growth recently. If we look um, at what the world economy is likely to look like in a few years' time, I have a bar chart here which just slices up economic output um, around the world um, between the developed and the emerging countries. And again, you can see very clearly here that the um, developing world, although continuing to grow, will be outstripped by emerging market growth. And China is a very significant portion of that, as you can see from that graph, but it's by no means the only market um, which is going to become substantial. And that's been an enormous driver of our 
research activity within the business in terms of where we focus our, our content generation firepower, um, but also the research efforts that we support outside among our clients and the academic community. Now, just thinking about how we do this, um, we have a significant in-house um, resource, so we have around 120 analysts within the business who are focused primarily on, on economics and politics, but also some of them on industry issues. But we also work with about 260 um, contributors, as we call them, who are based all around the world who do data gathering on our behalf. So in difficult to, in markets where data availability is very difficult, um, we have people on the ground who support us in acquiring data, and that's both numerical data but also textual data, so data on what's happening in the political scene as well. So we have on the ground access to information sources. Um, if we look at the business lines that, that we support, I won't focus too much on this, but just so you're aware, uh, we have what we would call custom solutions. Now, in the context of academia, that often means bespoke data feeds and bespoke, um, so bespoke numerical data feeds, but also bespoke text data feeds to support particular research efforts. Um, for our commercial clients, that's more often traditional consulting on market entry. Um, we have a series of, of subscription offerings, um, and many of you are subscribing to those anyway, so our flagship um, country report, but also many other publications that we have that, that academic institutions around the world subscribe to. Um, we have membership organisations too, those primarily operate in the emerging markets, and so we do have um, some academic clients who belong to those, but mainly that's in China um, or other parts of Asia. Uh, just to move on and think a little bit about the way the business is structured and our strategic imperatives, because I think people often ask where the next um, developments will come for the EIU. Um, I divide the business into two pieces, the subscription services that we have, which includes our publications, our databases, um, and our custom research offerings, which is our consulting offering. I think the thing that people are not particularly aware of is that we have been developing more industry-specific capabilities over time. This presentation won't really touch very much on those, but we are building data sets in the area of public policy, and particularly strong data sets in the area of healthcare. And we've been making a number of research firm acquisitions over the past few years to bolster our industry-specific capability. So if any of you have industry-specific research agendas, um, we may be able, to be able to support you on that. Um, just think about how we work. Um, essentially, it's not a very complicated business model. Well, clients have questions, be that in academia or be that in the corporate arena, and we attempt to deliver answers to our clients through the provision of cu customised data sets or quite complicated analytics, and my colleague Chris Pierce on the phone is responsible for much of that analytic offering. Um, now, if we look at how we deliver it, um, many of you will have seen our subscription databases, um, politics and economics, I shall go through those in a minute, some industry forecasts, uh, but also what we do on cities and we have some particularly rich offerings on China um, because both academia and our commercial clients are very interested in that. Um, we have our consulting operation as well, uh, much of that involves cross-country benchmarking, demand forecasting and the like, and then these specialist practices I mentioned earlier. So um, clients engage with us across all those areas, academia perhaps most commonly in the top one, the subscription databases. Um, if we just move on, think about how we ensure quality, I saw some people posted questions before um, this webinar started, one of those questions was around quality and how we stack up against the competition. Um, well, I've already mentioned the number of people that we have, so a large analytical team and then people on the ground in markets that we cover who are helping us gather data. Um, that data gathering exercise is, is actually very expensive. Um, we are a long-lived company, as you've heard, we were created in 1946. We have many clients around the world. That um, renewable client base has enabled us to build up a substantial um, size team helping us doing data gathering and without that team it would be very difficult to say um, things which are, are interesting and profound about some of these smaller markets that we cover because we cover every country in the world. Um, we put a lot, a lot of emphasis on our analytics so that's both qualitative so we put a lot of emphasis on the capacity of our analysts to form judgments about the political environment and the business environment but we also do a lot of modelling and my colleague Chris Pierce um, is responsible for the team that does much of that so our econometric um, modelling capabilities are actually quite strong. And then finally we put a lot of effort into uh, quality control. 
Um, and I know that for the academic community particularly, and we've already heard um, earlier on in this presentation, the pitfalls that can occur if you are not careful about quality control on data sets. We invest a lot of time and effort in that um, activity. We have specialists in each country who analyse all our data for outliers, and then Chris Pierce, who's on the phone, um, runs a series of machine-based checks across all of our numerical data as well to look at outliers. So we, we are putting a lot of effort into ensuring that data quality is very high because our clients place a lot of reliance on the conclusions they draw from analysing our data set. Um, why are we successful? Well, I think um, obviously um, everyone has a view on, on, um, on what it is that drives their, their business success, but I think we have a very large team and that is important for us. Um, we adopt not a purely quantitative approach to the way that we work. We put a lot of emphasis on qualitative issues and in the markets in which we operate, those things are very important. Um, the political environment, the socio-demographic environment is very important as a driver of outcomes, say in sub-Saharan Africa, and we focus a lot on those. Um, we cover everywhere, um, and that's very important for a lot of our clients who need universal coverage, so we cover every market. Um, our sensitivities to politics is actually key, I think, to what we do. Um, we are editorially independent. Um, the Economist Group is independently held. We're a private company. Um, we don't take positions in the equity market, for example. Um, we are very clear and transparent in our positioning, and so we don't have any vested interests. Um, so our conclusions um, are not are tainted by other sorts of commercial obligations. Um, and we've been around for a long time, and that gives us an interesting history. Um, and our analysis is available going back in archive format pretty much to the beginning of when we existed. Um, we also keep records of what our forecasts used to be, so for academic projects that involve looking at what people were saying about China, for example, 20 years ago, we have records of what we were thinking about China at that time. Um, our core expertise divides amongst country, so it's economics and politics, and the business environment, industry, um, we cover six significant strategic industries, healthcare, um, financial sector, automotive, um, consumer goods. Um, so we have quite a bit of industry coverage, which is longitudinal in nature, but across about 60 markets. And then we do risk assessment. And we actually are an accredited risk um, credit risk rating agency within the European Union because we do sovereign, set, sovereign credit ratings, but we also look at operational risk issues too. Um, now, for those of you who subscribe to us, directly from us, and I'm aware that many academic clients actually subscribe to us via um, a provider such as ProQuest, um, but for those of you who subscribe directly, you would be accessing us through our website, economist.com, and actually if you don't know who I am, that is a photo of me um, on the front of the website, I don't usually feature there, but I was being interviewed on the global economy at this particular occasion when we took the screenshot. Um, and we also, so academic clients, I think for research purposes often it's more useful to take a bespoke data feed in a format that works for the software that you are using, but many of our clients would be accessing through this kind of front end. Um, if we look at the sorts of things that we cover, um, our political analysis is cut across all 203 markets that we assess. That clearly is text-based. Um, we do actually provide numerical ratings for a lot of aspects of the um, political environment and that is very important for a lot of our academic clients because it means that you can do regressions that include um, quantified assessments of the political scene um, but you can see from that screenshot there that there is a lot of text based analysis going on there as well. In terms of our economic analysis as you would expect from our name, um, we invest a lot of time and effort in our economics. Um, we have run quite sophisticated models across all of the countries that we cover. Um, everywhere gets a forecast which is at least five years long and at many markets we will be forecasting for 20 years. Um, I think for the academic community that's interesting. Um, for many of our commercial clients it's vital. Um, we work with a lot of clients that are building power stations or dams where a long run perspective is very important. Um, this screenshot here shows that in text format actually of course you can take those forecasts in a numerical database as well. Um, if we just move on. Um, we do a lot of risk assessment, as I mentioned, um, both credit risk um, and operational risk. Both of those, there are qualitative assessments, so you can look at the text and mine the text there. But we also have quite sophisticated numerical models for both of those things. And one of the um, ways that we see the academic community engaging with us on risk is to take our risk scoring databases and use their, those as the basis for some modelling work that they are doing um, to understand um, particularly emerging market risks. Um, we cover 
finance. Um, now we cover finance as an industry. Um, I'm not going to talk about the other industries that we cover, except to make the point that we do have longitudinal industry data across a number of different industries. Um, but I think finance is particularly important because for so many of the markets that we analyse, access to financing and sources of finance is vital for their economic development. And we do quite a bit of work to understand sources of finance for the emerging markets. We also do quite a lot of work on the regulatory environment. And this is an area where right now most of our analysis is in text format, um, but we have a project underway at the moment internally to also codify um, our regulatory analysis so that we are providing scores for countries across a variety of, of um, different aspects of their um, business regulatory environment. And again, that's very powerful, I think, or that will be powerful for the academic community in terms of estimation, trying to understand development and economic outcomes in the context of the regulatory environment. Um, we do a lot of work on business issues more generally. Um, so if we, um, so we look at across, as I mentioned, a whole series of different sectors. We also analyse the quality of the business operating environment in general, um, and that can be quite powerful in terms of understanding whether government reform programmes are bearing fruit or not. That's done in both a qualitative and a quantitative way. And then just f finishing up on our text analysis. Um, we do some very granular and specific work on China. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, China is now the second largest economy in the world. It probably will overtake America um, at some point in the next 10 years or so. China is so big as an opportunity that very few of our clients engage with it on a national level. So we launched a service a few years ago which actually looked at China from a provincial and a city level. So we analysed all 31 provinces and, and nearly 300 cities in China. Um, and that um, includes some quite sophisticated econometric modelling, which means that we can do quite detailed economic forecasting. And also, we have quite a lot of forecasts associated with demography and income distribution across um, all the cities, the major cities in China. Um, and then that's augmented um, by some textual analysis. So we actually analyse the quality of the business environment and the political environment at the city level in China. And that's been very important for our commercial clients, but I think also it's quite a rich data source for the academic community trying to understand the manner in which China is developing. And then just briefly on our numerical databases, um, a very popular service that we supply to the academic community is in our macroeconomic data service called Country Data, um, which is how we have our own online portal which you can access, but we also make that available through a number of third um, party providers, so you can subscribe to that via Bureau Van Dyke's databases, also via Haber Analytics databases too. Um, if we, um, we have our uh, market indicators and forecast database, I guess the two interesting things about this is that this is where you would go if you wanted to understand our industry coverage. So this is where we keep all our numerical data associated with industry developments. And we are, at the moment, improving the quality of the city level analysis that we do that sits under this service. So we are working on a 50 Asian city data set which will be launched into this database at some point over actually probably the next few days. Um, so that's going to be, so I think cities are going to be a big development area for us over the next few years and we're starting with this particular service and, and with a focus on Asia. Um, and then finally, World Investment Service. Um, this is an interesting service um, which was primarily designed for our commercial clients but it's been very interesting to the academic community. It includes a lot of information about the costs of setting up businesses in locations around the world and also quite a bit of information about deal flow, so who is investing in what assets in which countries around the world and that could be quite powerful in terms of understanding um, cross-border capital flows and what's driving those around the world. So that's hopefully given you a flavour for the data sources that the EIU is able to provide, or at least a snapshot of those, um, and the ways that, that some of our academic clients engage with those. Now I'm going to hand over to my colleague who's in London, um, based in London but also physically in London right now, who's going to take you through some case studies of how our information has actually been used um, in order to drive a research agenda. And he has three case studies which he's just going to take you through and then I think we can break for questions. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, so as Robin said, I want to talk you through um, three of our kind of case studies that hopefully give a flavour perhaps of how our information can be applied uh, to some areas of, of uh, academic uh, research. Um, we're going to start off uh, with the misery index, thinking right now perhaps we could have started off somewhere um, happier. Um, but the, the misery index, I think it's probably a concept most of you are, are familiar with. Um, it's a kind of a, a concept developed in the US in the 1960s by 
by Arthur Oakham when he was chair of the uh, Council of Economic um, Advisors. And it's a very kind of simple gauge uh, using economic data of kind of, uh, I guess, social costs and, uh, and kind of difficulties in, uh, that are caused by economic factors. So it's simply the sum uh, of the unemployment uh, and inflation rate. Um, and as I say, has been used kind of uh, since the 1960s. Barrow did some work on it um, as well. I think uh, many of you may have seen it used to compare presidential terms, uh, for, for example, and see how, in kind of posthumously, how, how different presidents uh, perform. Um, but more recently, um, and uh, for the late 2000s, uh, Steve Hankey has actually extended that concept. So Steve Hankey of John Hopkins uh, University has used that concept, but used powered by EIU data, by, by our uh, country data service, it's taken that misery index internationally. So the table you can see here uh, shows some of the results, I think, from the, the, the 2013 uh, kind of misery index. So it looked across 90 or so um, countries, looked at uh, unemployment uh, and obviously the inflation rate, also looked at kind of interest rates and also kind of a, a measure of economic growth through real growth uh, per capita. Um, and it looks those measures together to, to identify kind of areas of kind of economic um, stress. Um, and so because of the way that we work and some things that Robin described about the way we're, we're set up, um, we have, uh, say, a big uh, analytical team, a big team of analysts that can help us uh, compile this information. We have a wide network that allows us to, to, to collect uh, information. We have standard frameworks, consistent frameworks that allow us to, uh, to, to get all this information together and make these kind of, particularly these international um, comparisons that I think is an area where we're um, particularly um, strong. And I think also one of our strengths is our ability to, to pull together quantitative data but also to quantify perhaps some of these softer concepts, so concepts around kind of the political um, environment, perhaps uh, concepts around kind of uh, regulation or quality of in institutions and so forth. Um, and so, just one example of the, of the misery index, uh, I think, is, is a kind of part of a much wider family, hopefully, of perhaps happier indices, uh, where we can look at uh, different areas such as, you know, kind of how how environmentally kind of friendly uh, cities are. We can look and compare uh, business environments. Um, uh, across countries, so we look at kind of ten, 10 categories ranging from uh, kind of uh, political effectiveness through to uh, policy towards private private enterprises. We can we can capture these factors uh, across countries in a very consistent way um, that uh, allows us to make these statements um, across these across these various um, countries. And of course, this helps uh, inform us about you know kind of. The, the, the ranking, the standing of, of these countries. Um, and as in the case of the misery index, I think there are kind of extensions to that. I mean, some of the work that's been built on top of that um, has looked at particular, you know, particularly at crime rates and how that relates to the misery index and, and how uh, the correlations exist between these different factors. So again, it can be used, these top line indices can be used to explore uh, perhaps kind of deeper uh, areas of research um, as well. So here, one example of a kind of a, a, a kind of a very direct use of our, our data, we have kind of exclusively provided the information uh, for this uh, for this misery index. Um, moving on, perhaps to the second case study. Um, so what we wanted to do here was um, show you how our data has been used, particularly in the area um, of economic growth uh, theory. Uh, so here we see, if you like, some of the, if you like, the building blocks of, of growth. So Barrow, uh, back in 1997, uh, tried to look at uh, what factors really impacted uh, on economic growth. What, what factors allowed countries to grow at different rates and, and different uh, levels? Um, and he put in place a kind of a cross-country uh, framework. He looked at a kind of wide cross-sections of countries, around 80 plus countries. He looked at growth over um, the decades, and he looked at some of the factors, so as you see here, kind of factors around uh, education, uh, you know, how open economies are, the level of investment, uh, how kind of regulation and the rule of law impacted on growth. And he tried to quantify and pick out some of these factors uh, that allowed um, 
you know, kind of, you know that identified how countries can grow. Um, and in many of his subsequent papers, uh, he drew heavily on uh, EIU um, data, um, so using information from our country data again for those reasons of kind of international comparability, the kind of the, the breadth of our uh, data set, both in terms of the geographical coverage, but also some of the kind of the concepts that we cover from the kind of headline macro data uh, all the way through uh, to kind of some of these kind of softer uh, indicators um, as well. Um, so for its use within that kind of academic research, we've actually used it. So the next slide we can see how uh, we've kind of applied that model to our own long-term forecast. So we use a Barrow-type framework. Um, as Robin was talking about how you know, we expect China to, to overtake uh, the US when we look at how we expect the world to look um, in 2030, or kind of, in fact, we are extending that out now to 2050, um, we actually use that kind of that similar framework, a supply side framework, where we look at factors like regulation and say openness and education, uh, say life expectancy. Life expectancy looks strange there because it goes into the model twice, once as a kind of a benefit, growing life expectancy is good, uh, but also as a kind of negative because obviously as that kind of grows up, um, you know, the aging populations can be uh, a drag on the economy. So, but we build these factors into to the models and say use that framework uh, to drive our own kind of long-term um, forecast. So very much that kind of analysis, that, that research, identifying those, those drivers helps us as a company um, understand uh, the, the future. I think uh, on the next slide, um, and we can also then think about how we can look at specific issues. I think this is quite an important kind of idea. Um, so here again, the kind of Barrow used that framework. Uh, and so on the right hand side, you, you can see a kind of chart looking at kind of education um, against the growth rate, but not just the kind of the, the headline growth rate. But this is the growth rate when you control for all the other variables that were in his model, so the rule of law and the kind of openness and the kind of regulation and all those different variables. When you control for those, you know, this is a bit that's explained um, by, by schooling. And I think that idea is, is quite um, an important one because uh, when you want to compare populations, when you want to look across um, you know, different countries, you want to compare wherever it might be, uh, you know, instant rates for, for cancer, then you, you need to control for, for these different environmental uh, factors, these country-specific factors, and you need to kind of be able um, to, uh, you know, to, to, to make sure that those are accounted for within your model before you understand you know, what that instance of cancer is kind of driven by you know, kind of rising you know, the level of income and the kind of, uh, uh, those types of measures rather than just on its own kind of merit. So, I think this idea um, of, of this controlling uh, control variables, I think, uh, is one that can be applied in many areas of what we do in state because of the breadth of the data that we have. Um, the type of data, you know, those environmental variables are well captured I think, by by many of our, our data sets that we can um, provide. Um, the final uh, case study is, is in a bit more of a specific area. Um, as Robin said, we uh, we, we cover uh, a wide range of countries. We have a big contributor network um, that helps us kind of pull information from from, from all these places. Um, as part of our contributor network, we also have a, a contributors that help us uh, pull pricing uh, information, um, and that's driven sort of quite a kind of a kind of niche area kind of uh, of, of of research. Um, before I get to that, I mean, on the right-hand side, you see the big, the big Mac index, I think, uh, probably a concept, again, that many people are um, familiar with, and the, I guess underlying that is the idea of purchasing power um, parity, um, and that in turn is kind of underpinned by this idea of, you know, that there is a kind of law of one price, that, that you know, if any price differentials kind of exist, then arbitrage ought to kind of uh, to, to erode uh, the, those price differentials in, you know, kind of in the absence of uh, tariffs and, and, and uh, cross-border trade uh, issues and, and so forth. Um, that um, law of one price, I mean, a lot of work and research has been done around kind of despite price dispersion um, and looking at, you know, kind of where kind of, you know, 
prices are different and uh, measuring kind of goods uh, and, and services um, and looking at how they compare um, across different kind of geographical uh, economic uh, geographies. Um, and so one way that we kind of help do this is through our cost of living um, survey. So I mentioned these contributors that go out and collect um, price information um, for us. So for example, in, in the example of the, in the, in the first paper uh, by Cruciani, um, we helped collect uh, data on about 200 uh, individual goods and services across about 122 cities. Uh, we had that pricing data going from about 1990 uh, through to 2000, um, and that helped that study look at, if you like, the interaction of um, get the characteristics of those goods with the economic geography to look at where there were differences in, in prices and looking at those relative prices between between those um, geographies. Um, and say so these kind of EIU kind of micro level data sets you know, where we have you know collected sort of prices ranging from you know, sliced bread to kind of domestic services um, you know, have helped kind of support that kind of um, quite detailed kind of research on, on price um, dispersion. So that was perhaps the kind of the last one, uh, last case study I wanted to kind of introduce. Um, and perhaps now I'll hand back to, uh, to Bernie and, and the Q&A. Thanks, Chris. So, uh, you and Robin covered a lot of territory. This is actually, there's, we could probably devote several hours to looking more at the, the way economic data is collected, aggregated, processed and, um, and made available. Um, we, uh, we will, we will uh, somebody asked on the chat whether we're going to archive this, these presentations. Yes, we do. It, it will be on the Sierra YouTube channel. And there'll be a link to that sent to you all, anybody who's registered to this for this webinar um, as soon as it gets posted up there. So we we're, are particularly happy to have the people from the Economist Intelligence Unit because we are um, looking at, as I said, uh, negotiating terms or obtaining good terms for access to Economist Intelligence Unit data sets, databases, and publications for CRL libraries. Um, we think that it's uh, that it is, it's appealing because the Economist is known for its historical depth and its, the political contextualization of economics. So it's not just financial data. They're also ever, are very impressive in their international scope, and so these are these are good things. And um, this is why we are focusing so much on the Economist today. Uh, we will be looking at the um, the, um, the relationship between the economist data and, and open access data, open access databases as well. But um, we have a number of questions that have come in and I, I want to get to them. So um, the first one is a question about, a number of people asked why um, the economist um, replaces or erases the historical forecast numbers and replaces them with actual, the actual numbers that, that took place. Sure. So I, mean, I think for those of you not familiar with the services of, on, on our numerical databases, um, we we actually re, we reissue those every week as new information becomes available. Um, and essentially, when you look at a series, let's say economic growth in America, um, there's historical actual data, which is clearly um, uh, taken directly from the official statistical sources um, over here in the US. And then there's our forecast, which extends out, as Chris said, actually to, to 2050 for, for some data. Um, and when, when new information is released by the official um, statistical sources, um, that overwrites our forecast. In fact, we, we update our forecast automatically at that point. So I guess the question is, well, why do we do that? Why do we not maintain a, the, our, our historic forecasts? Well, the reason that we don't do it is that the, our clients, uh, or the vast majority of our clients, the use case they are most interested in is being able to take a seamless data set, say from 1980 to 2030, a single line where as much of that that is real data, efficient data is, um, is possible and then our forecast at the end of it. But what we do do is that we maintain separately a database of what our forecasts were at any given point in time. Now we've been doing that numerically for, and Chris will probably be better able than me to, to, to say, but certainly for, for many years now. Um, and in fact, prior to that, obviously, we have um, facsimile copies of what the forecasts that we published in reports. Um, so 
for research institutions which are interested in what we were forecasting at some point in the past, that information is generally available. For more recent years, it's actually available in an electronic format. If you go back a long way, then actually it's, it's, it would need to be mined from a, from a facsimile of a full text report. Uh, we do make that information available for academic study. We don't make it available for our commercial clients, at least not generally. Um, that tends to be quite difficult for us on a commercial basis to do that. Um, but for academic clients, we, we can and have made our historical data sets available, our historical forecast data sets available. So for the sort of analysis where people want to know what we were saying about China, um, that is available, but it's not um, easily accessible through our um, for core information portal. You have to come to us for us for a bespoke fee of that. Uh, question, do we have some sub-national data information available in our products? Yes, we do. Um, so um, there's a few, I guess, a firstly, as I mentioned during the presentation, we have a particular emphasis on China. Um, so we, we cover about 300 cities in China as well as all the major provinces. So there's some pretty detailed information there. Um, Chris Pierce also mentioned a number of, of different indices. When he was talking about the Big Mac Index, he, he referenced um, some services that we have there. We have for a very long time been collating a lot of cost information across about 150 cities around the world. Um, so that is also available as a database. So we have a lot of city level cost data um, that we we use, academic communities use for many things, so for, for making um, purchasing power parity at the city level type information. Um, some of our commercial clients use it for calculating expat relocation packages, for example. Um, and then we are just launching a city level um, economics, so that's demographics um, and income distribution primarily database across Asia with a view that during 2015 that will be expanded into Africa, the Middle East and Latin America. So um, cities, we already have a fair amount of information available on the, off the shelf around cities. We're launching more in 2015, we'll, we'll expand particularly that income and demographics database at the city level across much of the world beyond Asia which is where we're at at the moment. And then on a bespoke basis we have collected some very granular data sets for specific clients which has given us an insight into everything from environmental policy at the city level um, to the quality of palliative care. Um, and so those data sets are also available. So we have quite a bit of sub-national stuff. Um, it's a question about industry. Um, the, on the presentation I didn't really touch much on this but just so that people are clear, I mean we cover industries which we regard as strategic, um, it's not a very well defined term, but essentially industries which are generally important to the economy and where um, the government hand can be felt quite quite heavily upon them. And so we cover energy, um, telecoms and technology, uh, the financial services industry, the automotive industry, uh, we cover retail and consumer goods, and then we cover healthcare. Um, so those, the coverage varies slightly, but for all of them we look at about 60 markets, um, and those tend to be the most important 60 markets for that particular industry, which moves a little bit, particularly energy, where, uh, where sometimes the countries are quite small, but if they're major energy producers, we will cover them. Um, so we have longitudinal data sets, um, which include forecast information covering those areas. Um, and then, as I mentioned, that we are trying to deepen our industry coverage. We've made a couple of research acquisitions in healthcare um, over the course of the last couple of years or so, and that's given us access to much richer data sets within the healthcare arena, particularly one of the businesses that we bought has some very granular information right down to the hospital level within Asia. Um, so that's been quite powerful for, for our commercial clients who are interested in, in um, transacting with that community, but actually for academia as well in terms of understanding the development of the healthcare system in Asia, and, and we will be expecting um, to make other industry-specific research acquisitions and deepen our data set in that way as well. So there's quite a bit of industry data available. One particular question, um, Robin, is the, um, the capabilities and rights for text, for downloading for purposes of text mining and data mining, is that how's, what's the EIU plan on that? Or, or for, um, you mean the technical capability or the commercial, uh, the, the, the rights? Um, well, both. I know they're two very separate things. Yeah. I mean, you can give the rights without uh, enabling the capability. Uh, I guess we, um, our primary data set, um, so our primary access portal, which is our own portal, EIU.com, um, that, that is 
really optimized around contemporaneous content. It does include an archive, um, an archive both in HTML format but also in PDF, um, and that archive extends back to the mid-1990s. Um, and then we have our numerical data sets which are actually quite well set up for, for um, downloading into standardized formats, so that's, um, that's all relatively straightforward. Um, for organisations which need to take very, very long downloads of data, the way that we would generally deal with that is through a bespoke feed. We have the capability to dip into our content database, which is well structured um, for our internal use, and pull out a bespoke feed that's formatted to your requirements and deliver it directly into your systems, and that's generally the preferred method for academic institutions which are looking for a particular um, to use the data in a particular kind of way. It's m much easier for you and actually for us to do that than to try and scrape it from our um, websites. In terms of legal restrictions, um, we're actually pretty broad-minded about the way that the academic community can use our information. Um, the one thing that we, we don't appreciate is republication. Um, obviously, we're a commercial entity, and so we have to be very careful about that. Um, we we um, derive significant revenue from these data sources, and we want to make sure, make sure that we continue to have the ability to invest um, behind that. So we're, we're keen to make sure that the information is not republished in a manner which means it's easy for our commercial clients to access. But we're pretty broad-minded about the way the academic community can, can use our information. So we, we're, um, we're generally very open. If you need to do something specific, um, then actually Kevin, who is on the phone, would be very happy to have a conversation about how we can make that possible. But generally, our terms of the academic community are pretty open. Yeah, that's Kevin Carlson, who's the representative who is here. We'll give you his uh, contact information in a few minutes. We, um, we are, um, Cyril is in discussions with Kevin and with the people at the Economist Intelligence Unit about obtaining favorable terms for access to Economist content. I think the uh, one advantage that you have as the Economist EIU is that it's your own data that you're not, um, you're not licensing proprietary data from other sources that might get in the way of that's correct. allowing text mining and data mining. That is, that is correct. Um, the, uh, uh, we've talked a lot about economic data here because I think that's um, just given the, the name of our organization and probably the thing we're most tightly associated with. But as Chris Pierce mentioned, I think I alluded to, um, we do invest a lot of effort in analysis of the political environment, the business environment. But one of the things that perhaps people are not aware of is we invest a lot of time and effort in codifying that numerically. Um, so that means that we have quite rich numerical data sets which rate the openness of society, the quality of the political system, um, everything from the way that the rule of law is applied. Um, those data sets, which are, as I say, are numerical and can therefore be used in econometric estimation, um, are proprietary to us, and we've invested a lot of time over the years in building those up. Um, again, just in the same way as we have historical information about our forecasts, we have historical information about how we did rate countries in the past, and that can be very powerful for the academic community. And obviously, um, we, we fully own those data sets, and uh, that means it's very easy for us to license those for academic usage. Good. Thank you, Robin. I think that's probably all the time that we have. I'm sorry, we didn't get, there were a number of questions we didn't get to, but um, we'll, we'll do our best in answering those through other channels. Um, I, I'm grateful to Robin View and Chris Pierce from Economist Intelligence Unit for joining us today from London and from Chicago. And uh, I hope this has been useful for you. Uh, Gwen Einhead is gonna give a wrap up. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Robin and Chris, for joining us today. Thanks to all the attendees, uh, all of you in the chat. Uh, we have other events coming up if you'd like to join us. If you're coming to Chicago for ALA Midwinter this year, we will be having a tour of CRL facilities, and sign up for that is available on our website. We also already have a date set for our annual meeting, which will be a webcast this year on April 24th. When you leave the session, uh, pop-up survey will show up on your screen. We really encourage you to fill that out. We really love comments. We're continuing to uh, adapt and refine our webinar program, and so we'd love to hear what you thought of today's event. This event will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel if you'd like to view it again or share it with colleagues. Uh, if you want to find out about these kind of events more frequently, please sign up for CRL Connect. There's a page on our website. It's really easy to do. And then our bi-weekly newsletter will keep you informed of events like, events like this and others. 
And you can also find us on Facebook and on Twitter. So thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon.